Um, hey, what's up, everybody? <laughs> it's nice to see you all. It's nice to be able to spend some time uh, with my relatives here, hanging out at the Victoria Inn. Uh, funny story, uh, when I got here about half an hour ago, I thought that I would get my energy up and I would go get a cup of coffee and there was no cream, okay, and, and it, it ended up being sorted out, thank you Tina, but uh, it did get sorted out, but there was no cream and uh, I was really just getting excited about how many faces I was seeing, how many different communities we had represented here. Um, I was taking a look at the workshops that are being shared and uh, cruising the hashtag, right? So if you haven't been tweeting out pictures, I promise I won't get offended. LTF2017 is our uh, hashtag. Um, but uh, uh, it's been really, it's been fun, the, 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 the moment that I've been here. But it gets funny when I get my coffee with no cream, which is okay. Um, but I'm like, ah, I got a little bit of time before 11. I'm going to go and explore. There's this whole other room here that I have yet to experience. So uh, I go wandering over into the next room, and there's a little bit of a gaggle of people, and so I'm just waiting my turn. Uh, but I finally make it in uh, to the next room, and I'm about two or three steps into the next room. And you guys know you just were in that room. Um, it is a little bit overwhelming to be in that room, and I was not expecting all of the beautiful artwork and all of the, the displays just in every direction all around me. So I stopped paying attention to what I was doing and I just started looking at all of the amazing things and you know, naturally I smashed directly into somebody who's right in front of me. My high coffee in my hand splashes all over their back and my front and uh, it was a little bit of a traffic jam. But I'm okay, my hands are a little bit coffee smelling now but uh, didn't get any stains on anyone. But what that was for me was it's that sense of wonder. It's that sense of wonder that our young people can feel when they walk into a space where all of a sudden they see themselves reflected in that space. It's that sense of safety. Um, it's, it's that feeling that takes your breath away when you walk into a space and you see your relatives and you see people who you feel safe around and you see uh, designs and colors and artwork that feels like home and feels like your spirit. And I literally felt like in that moment I left my body. That's why I smashed into the gentleman who was in front of me. Apologies. I, I know you're in the crowd here. I'm sorry. Um, and, he, and he was like, uh, it's good that you're the speaker. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, so it, was a, it was an interesting experience for me. and. Uh, and it just really reminded me of, of the feeling that we want to give to our learners and our students when we create spaces for them. We don't want our young people to walk into our schools or the places of learning, and we don't want them to feel uh, unsafe. We don't want them to uh, get nervous or become afraid. We want them to have that sense of wonder. We want them to feel safe. We want them to feel like the space that they're in is a reflection of who they are so that they can have that pride, uh, lift their head up high, and be proud of who they are and where they come from. So um, I just thought I would share that story uh, just to get started. So my name is Michael uh, Redhead Champagne. It is my honor uh, to be here hanging out with you educators today. Of course, uh, it's important for me to acknowledge that we are here on Treaty 1 territory, um, homeland of our, our Métis relatives, Anishinaabe, uh, Dakota, Cree, and many others. Um, acknowledging the territory that we're on is, I think, important for us to do, but it's also important for us to remind our non-Indigenous relatives as they begin uh, acknowledging territories and treaties that a land acknowledgement has to be more than pretty words that you say at the beginning of a talk. Um, it has to be more than a plaque that we put up on our school. It has to be a statement that you as educators or we as, a, as learning communities truly are committed to and believe in. If we believe in acknowledging our land and our territory, then I feel like our actions need to reflect that as well as our words. So the work I've been doing here in Winnipeg um, has been a long time coming. 
Um, just last month, I was able to celebrate my 30th birthday. Uh, woo, 30. So, so that's, been, that's been fun. I'm a real adult now. I'm so excited. I still keep getting invited to all these youth events. Michael, tell us what the youth think. And I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> Um, but there are amazing young people uh, that I've been uh, honored to work with uh, in, in, in my time, in my short three decades here on the planet. Um, but my story begins like many of your stories uh, begin. Um, and many of our, our students in our classrooms, uh, many of our stories begin this way. Uh, my story begins in the women's hospital here in Winnipeg um, and being taken at birth from my natural family. Um, child welfare, as we know, uh, in the province of Manitoba, is at epidemic proportions right now. Um, our children, more than ever, need safe spaces and safe helpers and people like us to make sure that they uh, can feel pride in their identity and who they are and make sure that they can find their way back home. And I think that for me, um, when I was born as Michael Redhead, and then I was immediately taken from my Redhead family, uh, our home community is Shimadawa, um, it created an immediate disconnect in, in my life at the very, very beginning. And uh, I, I explain that as part of my identity because as much as all of the great things that I'm going to talk about helped shape me, uh, a lot of the negative things that happened in my life helped shape me too. And I think we have to be real and honest with our young people um, as they're growing and as they're learning uh, who they are. It's important for us to remind them that uh, those negative experiences can shape us into good people. Um, those, those bad uh, experiences that we have sometimes can be those memories and those reminders that we carry with us uh, as reminders of what we never want to be, what we never want to do. And, um, and I think for me, that feeling of disconnection is something that I would not wish, I would not wish upon my greatest enemy. Um, that feeling of disconnection from your home community and from your home family. And I was actually super honored um, uh, while I was sitting over here at the reserve table. I always like to joke when there's tables that are reserved and they're like, oh, Michael, you're going to sit over here. I'm like, trying to send me back to the reserve? <laughs> but I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, I had an opportunity to sit here um, at the reserved table. And um, I had a chance to meet uh, one of the amazing educators. And I know that there are many. Um, and, and if I had opportunity to do so, I would name every single community and educator who has uh, positively impacted me and taught me a little bit more about how we can innovate and create safe spaces, uh, raise funds in a creative way so that our young people can connect themselves back to their identity and their land. And I got to give a, a shout out to our relatives from Lake St. Martin and Charlotte Peebles, who came and spoke to Tina and I uh, during the break, because uh, they're doing some fantastic work. Um, speaking of being connected to the land, um, we all know our relatives from Lake St. Martin um, experienced uh, displacement in recent years due to government uh, decisions uh, and floods. And the uh, ripple effects of that decision is hurting our relatives in Lake St. Martin, but it's also hurting all of us. Um, when you're hurting, so am I. When your community is displaced, there's a part of me that feels displaced too. And um, if, if we want to repair our connection to the land, I firmly believe it's educators like Charlotte who are going to help make us get there. And uh, I just want to acknowledge the land-based program that, they're, that they've developed and they're working on uh, with Lake St. Martin students, where several times a year, they actually take kids uh, that are living here in the city now out of Winnipeg and connect them to summer camps, winter camps, uh, uh, teaching them about uh, medicines and food and, and land-based teachings so that young people uh, who are disconnected from their territories for now will have that opportunity to reconnect with the land and have that reminder that that's something that has been shared with me that we are the land and, and we don't want our young people to forget that. And so I just wanted to acknowledge Charlotte and the educators at Lake St. Martin um, and, and the work they're doing on land-based education just because I think it's so uh, inspiring and it's a good example for us to follow. So Charlotte, I don't know where you are, but uh, she's selling leaves. Uh, there she is right there. She's selling leaves for five bucks. 
um, and I, I just have to put the plug in, sorry. Um, uh, $5 per leaf, um, and you can be a part of uh, supporting the land-based program uh, for Lake St. Martin students getting connected uh, back to the land, and I think that's something we can all get behind uh, here at this conference. So uh, there's Charlotte. Everyone just remember where she is. Go find her later, and uh, let's, uh, let's show the students at Lake St. Martin how much we love them. So um, land-based programs, uh, connecting to the land. Here we are talking to First Nations ed educators about First Nations education. Um, it's important for us, as we do our work in schools, to remind our young people um, not only about one element of learning, the mind. And I think too frequently in Western school systems, and we, let's be real, we have no choice but to exist within Western school systems when we're delivering provincial curriculum, even in our own communities. And so what, that ends, what ends up happening at that point is we have to start being creative as educators to see how can we interpret this curriculum in such a way that we can still connect our young people to land, that we can still uh, build up the spirits of our young people so that they can be proud of who they are. Um, and it's, it, it does get tricky because the curriculum tells us this is how high you jump and this is when you jump that high. And it's, it's a little, you know, it's very instructive. It's curriculum, that's the point. But it's, it's almost, I feel like it's almost like it's our job as uh, educators for our young people from First Nations communities to find a way not only to uh, teach the curriculum. Um, okay, true story. Once upon a time, I was in education classes at the University of Winnipeg, and I would always get into fights with my professor. Always, arguments. It was nonstop arguments. I'd always, they would say something, and I would always be at the back of the room. Uh, excuse me, what about this? What about that? And, and it was important for me to do that. It was important for me to challenge um, in post-secondary uh, educators because uh, a lot of the things that were being taught was related to curriculum and related to, to those pieces of paper. <clears throat> and for sure, we, we need those pieces of paper. But I remember me posing a question back, uh, not only to my professor, but to my class. And this is the question that I asked. As future teachers, are we responsible for teaching curriculum or are we responsible for teaching people? Because I'm pretty sure we're responsible for teaching people. And people that we teach have hearts, minds, bodies, and spirits, and we cannot ignore those different elements of humanity. And if we only rely on curriculum we're really only speaking to the mind. And we're missing 75% of the people. And so I think it's important for us as educators to find ways to bring uh, spiritual knowledge, uh, emotional knowledge, physical knowledge uh, into the classroom and into our learning spaces so that our young people can have access to healthy minds, hearts, bodies, and spirits. Um, so I, I founded a group with some amazing young people here in the city. Um, even though uh, I grew up feeling somewhat disconnected um, from my natural family, uh, I, was, I hit the jackpot. I really did. Um, there was this beautiful family called the Champagnes in the north end of Winnipeg. And they were emergency foster parents. And uh, in the 1980s, they fostered over 300 children um, in their home as emergency foster parents. These were the highest needs, uh, level five, right? Um, so these were, our, these were our kids, our kids that needed safe places to be. And um, <clears throat> it was, I feel like I hit the jackpot because out of those 300 children, uh, the Champagnes adopted two of them. And I was one of those two children. And the Champagnes did such an amazing, yes, yes. And, and their example, um, more than anything they ever said, they said lots of things to me that I probably wasn't listening to. Um, but uh, more than anything that they said, <clears throat> their example is what sticks with me to this day. And the, the, the example that they set is that it is all of our responsibilities to take care of all of the children all of the time. And I think that that's something that we can all get behind. <clears throat> so.
So as I grew, um, and as we moved around, because the Champagnes were not a wealthy family, um, like many North End families and like many First Nations, we did not have tons of money. Um, and it meant that we always had to move around. So um, by the time I was in grade eight, we had moved 13 times. Um, and I, I know that this is an experience that many of us have had. And so having to move around all of those, uh, all of those different times for me gave me, I think, a pretty good perspective on classrooms and on teachers and on education and on learners and uh, on bullies and on youth suicide and on teachers who look the other way. And in all of my experiences uh, going to all of these different schools, I felt like I was in Groundhog Day. <laughs> you know how you go to a di you wake up the next day and you think it's the next day, but it's, it's Groundhog Day again and the same series of events happen. That's what I felt like was happening in, in my earlier school life. Because it didn't matter which school I went to, everywhere I went, there was that group of popular kids. And amongst that group of popular kids, there was always the one that didn't like Michael. And that one that didn't like Michael would always be the loudest. And it also felt like there was always that teacher that looked the other way. And so it was frustrating for me to see uh, time and time again uh, teachers looking down at what was happening amongst the students. And, and, and this is not uh, to fault the teachers who were not able to help me, but it's an observation that those teachers were too busy. They were too busy with their 30 uh, other students in their class, thanks to you know, class sizes. Um, they had to deal with those 30 students. Um, they had marking to do. They had extracurricular activities to do. They had a lot of stuff to do. And so I'm not mad at those teachers for looking the other way, but I share my story with all of us as educators today so that we can keep an eye on ourselves and our peers to make sure that we're not doing that, to make sure that we're not looking the other way when our young people are experiencing uh, bullying or uh, are, are made to feel unsafe in our learning environments. Um, I think we can look back into the history of Indian residential schools, and my mother, uh, Sylvia, went to residential schools in northern Manitoba. And we can see all of the examples of what we never want our classrooms to look like. And um, we have to learn about the history so that we don't repeat it. And so in sharing and in learning about things like Indian residential schools, I think it's really reminded me of the role that education is gonna have to play in helping all of us heal. Because it was in the four walls of the classroom where a lot of that damage um, was, was caused. And it's, I think, gonna be in the four walls of the classroom where the healing that we need to do happens as well. And so that's something that I feel like it's important for me as the son of a residential school survivor um, and as a product of the child welfare system to be able to explain that it is all of our responsibility to care for our children and it is important for us to bring in heart, mind, body, and spirit when we're caring for our young people. Um, so in 2010, I founded a group um, here in Winnipeg called Aboriginal Youth Opportunities. I didn't mean to, it was an accident. Um, here's what happened. I worked at Nadinaway. I'm sure some of you guys know Nadinaway. I worked there for four years. And I got to build really strong relationships with young people. And remember how I talked about feeling uh, disconnected uh, at the beginning of my talk? Well, when I went to Nadinaway, I felt connection. I was able to connect with other young people like me. Other young people that had been taken from their home communities. Other young people that um, were part of CFS. Uh, other young people that were living in poverty, other indigenous youth that had been bullied, other young people who were learning about their identity. So working at Nadinaway really connected me with uh, other young people and I realized that my experience was not just my experience. That's when I realized that those, those, negative, uh, those negative parts of my upbringing were very common. And one of the things that I learned was that the average age amongst First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, the average age that we first contemplate suicide is the age of 10. 10 years old, that's, that's the average, which means that in some of our communities it's much earlier, and in some of our communities it's a bit later. But I didn't know that when I was 10 years old that I was a statistic, because 
it was when I was 10 years old that I first began contemplating suicide myself. And I think it's important for us to talk about these types of things because our young people are dealing with a lot of this in silence right now. And we, we have to be able to talk to our young people about these things. When we lose a relative uh, to suicide, it hurts us. It hurts all of us. And there's a lot of unanswered questions that we have. But I think um, we can all look back into our own experiences. And we, can't, we can all ask ourselves the question, what was it that pulled me through? You're all sitting here right now. You all made it past 10 years old. How did you do it? What did you need to get there? Do you know what I needed? I needed a teacher to believe in me. And I was lucky that I had it. Um, I had a teacher who saw that I loved reading, who noticed that the um, only times that I seemed to be happy was when I was either in the library or I was away from the other students reading a book. And um, this teacher purchased for me uh, a book during Scholastic Book Club. Uh, my family couldn't afford it. Uh, the Champagnes were never able to afford um, Scholastic's Book Club. And again, no fault to them, but it was just a reality that we didn't have money. And so, like a lot of kids, when I would get those Scholastic Book Clubs, I would always get a pen and a paper, and I would like scribble on there, like just circle a hundred times, just because I think, maybe if I circle it one more time, the money will magically just appear in my life. So I would circle those books, like a lot. And um, I didn't notice it, but the, the teacher, I guess, was paying attention. And uh, I was 10 at this time, and uh, Ms. Holmes, my teacher, uh, said, or didn't say anything to me. She just said, all right, everyone, it's uh, Scholastic Book Club time. Put your work away. We're going to read. So 3 o'clock. I had made a plan uh, for 3.30 of that day to, to really hurt myself. Um, and in my head, that plan at 3.30 that I was going to execute um, was going to make things better. It was going to make things better for my classmates. It was going to make things better for my family at home. Um, it was going to make things better because I felt like, even at that young age, that uh, I was the common denominator of problems in my life. I felt like everywhere I went, I was the problem. So if I was the problem, my logical solution is to remove the problem. And unfortunately, in my 10-year-old mind, the most logical thing that I could do was hurt myself and, and, and be done. So I was ready at 3.30 that day, and I remember what a crappy day it was because that day I did experience a lot of bullying as well. Uh, recess especially sucked for me. I hated recess because I would go out uh, to play, quotation, quotation, with other students, and I would be by myself. I would watch other students play, and um, even uh, navigating from point A to point B uh, in the schoolyard grounds was difficult because students would uh, trip me, and I would fall down, hurt my knees, um, they would secretly punch me, they would whisper things in my ear, um, all covertly, all very, very ninja-like. Um, like, kids are slick. They know how to get these things under the radar, too. So um, I was experiencing all of that, and I was just waiting for 3.30. I was ready. I was like, oh boy, 3.30. But uh, 3 o'clock, uh, the teacher pulled out the box and said, all right, it's Scholastic Book Club time. And I could not have imagined a worse way to finish my time on this planet because I now had to listen to everybody else, all the other students in my class who, I, I would hear them talk about Scholastic Book Club, even the ones that would get books, they didn't even like those books. They didn't love those books. I loved those books. And I was very sad that uh, I wasn't gonna get one, like every time. So calling out the names of all the students, uh, to come and get their books. You can imagine my surprise when my teacher called out my name. Said, Michael, come get your book, in exactly the same tone of voice that she did for all the other students. So I was confused, and I had a choice at that moment that I needed to make. I had the choice of lying and going up and taking a book and spending the last 30 minutes of my life reading and being happy and escaping from my hurting. Or I had the opportunity to be honest and say, no, 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 teacher, I don't, that's not my book. I know we didn't pay for it. Um, it probably belongs to somebody else so that they could have their book. How many people think I said, no, 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 I don't want the book? 
Yeah, well, how many people think I took the book? <laughs> of course I took the book. <laughs> of course. Of course. I was like, heck yeah, if I only got 30 minutes left, I don't care if I'm taking someone else's book. I'm spending the last 30 minutes of my life as a hero. So, uh, so I did. I, I got up and I, I picked up that book. And I took that, that book back to my seat and I opened it up. And I looked in the front cover of the book and I recognized my teacher's writing. This is something that students do. They recognize their teacher's writing. And when the teacher writes something for you, just for you, it means a lot. And do you know what Ms. Holmes wrote in that book for me? She said, Michael, I'm proud of you. Keep up the good work. That's it. And so when 3.30 came around that day, I said, I'm going to have to do my plan another day because I have a book to read. And I will always be grateful to Ms. Holmes and the educators, um, like many of you, who go into their own pocket and provide that belonging and that welcomeness for students and reminding them that they matter, that they're gifted, that they belong, that, that I see you. And I just want to acknowledge all the Ms. Holmeses that are in the room. I know there are many. So thank you for the lives that you saved. So on behalf of all of the students that will never be able to find the words in the moment, thank you. Thank you to all of the educators here that didn't look the other way. All of the educators here that um, wrap their arms around their students and show them love. Um, all of the educators here that remind students that they are uh, worthy and deserving spirits and that what they believe and what, what, what their gifts are are worthy and the world needs them. And that's how, that's how Ms. Holmes made me feel. And get this, you want to talk about relationship permanence? You'll never guess who's uh, my Instagram friend 18 years later. <laughs> Ms. Holmes still likes my Instagram photos. And every time she does, every time she likes my photos, I, I feel like I'm that little kid again. I'm always like, ah, oh, Ms. Holmes. <laughs> and, and even though it's not in her writing anymore, it's just on Instagram, it still looks like her handwriting. And I still remember that feeling that she gave me. And now I call myself a street educator. Um, my classroom is a street corner. And I think of Ms. Holmes. And I think if I can buy a kid a book and write them a note of encouragement, I might be able to save a life. So guess how frequently I do that? All the time. All the time. I'm always like, trying to get books for kids. I'm always trying to write encouraging notes for them. Because I know the power that uh, a positive relationship from an educator to a student, how life-saving that can be and how life-changing that can be. And I know that we're all challenged in dealing with curriculum. How do we build these types of spaces in our classrooms? Well, I think, I think we all have the answer in our own experiences when we think back to being 10 years old. You all had a Miss Holmes in your life. You all had somebody that caught you when you were going to fall. And I want you to think about that person and how they made you feel and what specifically they did to make you feel that way. Because there's your set of instructions. There's your set of instructions on what you need to do for your students. You need to, perhaps it's get, get them a book. Maybe it's something that simple. Um, one of the things that we really try to emphasize um, with educators is the importance of relationships. So what I'll share with you guys quickly here is um, Aboriginal Youth Opportunities um, since 2010 with other young people who share a lot of my experiences and background. We started uh, coming together voluntarily and we started a group. So the group that we started uh, is now known as AO Movement, and you can find out more about us online, AO Movement, AYO Movement.com. And um, what we have done is we have created, the way we describe our work is we occupy negative spaces with positivity. And uh, a good example of that would be uh, my favorite classroom, uh, the corner of Selkirk Avenue and Power Street in Winnipeg's North End. Um, every Friday at 6 o'clock p.m. since November 18, 2011, 
a group of urban indigenous young people, including myself, have gotten together at that street corner to demand an end to violence in our communities. And 2011 was the year that Winnipeg captured the national title of murder capital of Canada. Selkirk and Powers was not a pretty place um, on November 18th, 2011. As a matter of fact, um, there had been a stabbing uh, just three houses away from uh, where Meet Me at the Bell Tower happens just days prior to us beginning there. It was a machete attack and it was involving an 11-year-old child. And, it's, and I, I see some heads nodding, so I think some of you remember uh, what that year was like. Um, we lost too many of our young people that year. Um, not only to violence, but to the ripple effects, because when our young people are grieving and they lose a relative, uh, that ripple effect sometimes hits harder than we expect it to. And our young people then begin uh, inviting uh, those thoughts of the spirit of suicide into their life again. And uh, that was what happened uh, in our circle. Uh, in November, uh, before November 18th, not only did we lose uh, two of our relatives to violence, we also lost one of our young people to suicide. And he was only 14 at the time, and uh, it was absolutely heartbreaking for us to lose uh, one of the people that brought us such joy um, in our life to suicide. And it left everybody with those questions again of like, what, what should we have done differently? Like, you know, like people blame themselves uh, when it comes to suicide. And I think this is why we as educators have to learn how to talk about it so that our young people don't blame themselves. Um, and what we really, I think, need to start doing is we have to pay attention to what we measure um, in our schools and in our classrooms because uh, education systems in general have quite a deficit-based way of operating. I remember working as an educational assistant in Winnipeg here, and on my first day of the job, I was um, a level C, uh, so I had to be a one-on-one -on -one, uh, educational assistant with a, with a student. And at the, at the office, I got there, I'm like, hey, I'm the EA, tell me what I do. It's been around three times, those things. Um, but they gave me a, a form, they gave me a form, they're like, all right, Michael, your job is to shadow this student, help them throughout the day, and fill out this form. Do you know what the form was called? It was called the bad behavior form. <laughs> so this is what I said. I said, okay, where's the other one? Where's the good behavior form? And they said, oh, no, 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 Michael. There is no good behavior form. The bad behavior form is so you can justify your job and your position here. I just could not believe it. I was like, are you kidding? You're lucky I don't quit right now. But I didn't, I needed a job, so I stayed. <clears throat> so I was like, all right, all right, I'll fill out your bad behavior form, but I want you to know that on the back of the bad behavior form, I'm gonna be documenting all of the good things that this student is doing. And I'm gonna share that with you every single day. And they said, you can do that if you want to, Michael, but we have no way of processing the data. We have no way of digesting the information. I'm like, you're a school, what do you mean? You don't have no way of processing good information. But they didn't. And I think that this is uh, symptomatic of our education system overall. We measure the bad, and we think that less bad is a party. Oh, we have, you know, we have less bad things happening. Everybody, woo, have a party. This is the same thing the Winnipeg police and the justice system does as well. Oh, well, uh, last year we had 25 homicides. This year we only have 21 homicides. Everyone have a party. I refuse. Hey, <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> um, I refuse to have a party because four less people are dead. To me, that's not cause for celebration. But you know what is cause for celebration? Measuring the good. And when I look back in 2016, sure, we could talk about uh, how many times people got together to punch each other in the nose and how many violent incidences have happened. The justice system, uh, the healthcare system will definitely capture those. But you know what health, education, and justice too frequently forget to measure? The good, the positive. And did you know that last year, at, in my favorite classroom at Selkirk and Powers, Meet Me at the Bell Tower got together 
on 53 separate occasions to build community, stop violence, and prevent the bad thing before it happened. 53 times. Guess how much of that is reflected in police reports? None of it. Guess how much of that is reflected in health reports? None of it. Guess how much is reflected in media? Five, because I fought the media to get them out there. <laughs> Legit. And, but here's my question. If we got together in the north end of Winnipeg on Selkirk Avenue, 53 times last year to punch each other in the nose, would the police see us then? Would the healthcare system see us then? Because I think they would. And that breaks my heart. And so it is up to us. I don't have faith in those systems, but I do have faith in all of you. That we can measure the good in our students' lives. That we can explain to our students when we're filling out those good behavior forms. Show them, hey, I want you to know that I noticed that you completed your assignment. I want you to notice that I see you sitting all the way through one whole class and you never used to be able to do that and I see your progress. I want you to see that I wrote it down and I'm handing this into the office. That's what I need the students to see. And so don't be afraid to be transparent with the students in your classroom. If sometimes you have to write down things on a bad behavior form and they say, hey, what are you writing down? Show them. Show them, say, I have to document behavioral things, however you want to phrase it. Everyone's got their own brand of phrasing. Um, I have to document things. So when you ran out of the class five minutes ago, I had to write that down. But look it, you're back in the class now, and look what I'm writing down on the good behavior. You know what, you guys get the point. If we have a good behavior form, our administrators and our schools should have mechanisms to process positive information. This is, this is my point. This is what I'm hoping for. So um, let's push together for that. They can't ignore all of us, right? So let's push together for that. So what I really wanted to talk about um, as well <laughs> is uh, our youth engagement strategy. So Aboriginal Youth Opportunities hosts me, meet me at the Bell Tower every Friday, but we also have uh, different initiatives that help target the spirit, the body, the heart, and the mind. Um, and we are all volunteers, so Aboriginal Youth Opportunities, uh, since our inception, has just engaged a bunch of volunteer helpers in the community, and everyone's got like a little area of expertise. Their area of expertise pertains to their gift. And I really hope that within our classrooms and our learning spaces, that's what we foster amongst our, our students. We foster their gift. We remind them that they have one. And we remind them that the gift that they possess and carry is something that the world desperately needs right now. Some of our young people will discount what they're good at. They're going to say, oh, I, uh, I make people laugh. Oh, uh, I'm a good listener. Oh, I'm a good friend. But that's it. You know what I mean? They'll say things that are absolutely beautiful and then minimize it right after. Okay, because they're not confident yet in their gift. And it's up to us to remind those young people, did you know that your gift of being a good friend could save a life? Did you know that your gift of making people laugh is something that we need today more than we ever have before? Turn on the news any day of the week and my point will be proven, that we need our young people to laugh. We need them to feel safe. We need them to, to learn and grow and be able to learn who they are and be themselves. One of the things that's critical, and I already know this, uh, just from observing the crowd, is that, do you, know what's, do you know what's a beautiful example of spirit that we can all bring into our classrooms? Laughter. Laughter is such a healing teaching. It's something that we can all share and we all possess it. So I, I want to share a beautiful joke that was shared with me by a young person in our community. You're going to love it. And feel free to uh, disseminate this to uh, anyone who needs a laugh. And if you know the answer, just shh. How do your grandparents make potatoes? Kukum and mushum. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> so
So that's a good one. That's a good one. I, I encourage you guys to use that one um, in your life. Um, so uh, laughter is very important. Laughter heals. Laughter reminds us that our heart is still beating. Um, laughter, this is what I like to say about laughter. Laughter is the byproduct of when your heart, mind, and body all agree. Laughter. So, and it's spiritual. It is a spiritual thing. We all just shared a laugh here. That was a beautiful spirit, and I know you all felt it. This is what we can do in our classrooms. We can make our young people smile, and that makes them feel safe. It lets their spirits soar. And then you can make them potatoes. I'm just kidding. Don't make them potatoes. <laughs> um, so, so I wanted to share with you guys. I don't know. How am I doing for time? I, I don't Five-ish? Okay, all right, 510-ish, all right. I wanna share our youth engagement strategy with you guys so you can use it in your classrooms to build uh, initiatives or programs or, or, or spaces for your students uh, to honor, their, honor relationships. So uh, Eros is our youth engagement strategy and I would like to share it with you before I finish. It's six points, so if you have one of these long things that are at your table, it's just perfect. Um, so it's an acronym. The, there's a really fun, my favorite thing about learning is uh, mnemonic devices, okay? Educators, you know mnemonic devices, right? Mnemonic devices, little tricks to teach people how to remember stuff. So you put it in an acronym, you put it in a song, put it in a, a rap. I don't have any educational raps yet, soon. If anyone's a rapper here and wants to do some educational rapping, please let me know. Um, but uh, mnemonic devices are really important and it helps young people learn. So for us, acronyms are critical. AROS is the acronym that I'm sharing with you all right now. A of AROS stands for access. And pretty much what that means is that we need to be accessible to our students in the way that they need us to be accessible. That means we go to them. That also means that uh, timing of any program or service that we offer is at a time that's convenient for them. Also means that we speak their language, which is sometimes tough. Young people literally speak a language of their own sometimes. Um, but it's important for us if we want to be accessible to learn what those language details are so we can be accessible. Also means uh, how we make ourselves available. Sometimes in person is the best way. In this world of screens and cell phones, our young people more than ever are craving human interaction. And that's not something that I think you're ever gonna hear uh, from anyone that talks about youth, because I hear people talk about youth all the time, and they're like, put it on social media, that's what the young people want. And yes, definitely, put it on social media, for sure. It's important to get that communication out there. And, and your digital example, and what you put out there on social media is the only part of you that is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So remember that when you're posting things on Twitter, Facebook, and social media. Um, but access, that's the first thing. We wanna be accessible to our young people in the way that they need us to be. That means we speak their language, that means we go to them. R is resource. Resource meaning uh, we wanna give the young people a resource that will be helpful to them. Something tangible that they can hold in their hand. Maybe that's school supplies, maybe it's food, maybe it's bus tickets, maybe it's an honorarium, maybe it's information, maybe it's a referral. Maybe it's a helpful person that can get them to the next uh, opportunity, right? A resource. And, and here's the thing, if you're a teacher or teacher assistant or you run a program, um, the resources that you have at your disposal are not yours. Those resources belong to the young people. And you have a job because those young people need those resources. And there are too many times where I've seen in communities, people act like, those, like the resources are coming out of their own pocket. And, and that is certainly not the case. So remember whose resources they are. The next R is relationships. And this has everything to do with the Miss Holmes and the book story. Um, we want to build relationships with young people so that they know that they are loved and respected. And we want to build relationships in our classroom where our young people know that they have a gift. And, and here's the thing, how many people here have heard young people in their classroom say, I'm not good at anything. Who said that? Yeah? Thought so. So when you hear a young person say that, play this little two-step game with them. Step one, list three things 
in your life that you like doing? I'll use myself as an example. I like high-fiving people. I like talking. I like playing Tetris. Okay, these are three things in my life that I like doing. Think of what your three things are. Once they're done, you then ask, pick one that you're good at. Conveniently, I'm actually terrible at Tetris, and I'm not that great at high-fiving either, even though I like it. Um, so out of those options, I would say talking is probably my gift. And so a, a relationship, like the relationship we have now, you guys and me, is one where we're honoring one another's gifts. I'm trying to honor your gifts as educators, and I feel like you're honoring my gift as a talker. So, so thank you uh, for honoring my gift. I appreciate that. Um, but, but the most meaningful relationships are ones where we can do that. We can see e each other's abilities and gifts, and we make space uh, for each other to share those, those gifts. The O is opportunity. Once you have a relationship with someone, you know what their gift is, let's create the conditions for that young person to share their gift. Let's find a way, whether it's in the school, in the community, um, on a street corner, let's find a way for that gift to be honored. If they're a singer, any, any gathering of people can become a crowd. If, uh, you know, there are so many different gifts that we can honor. The W is welcome. Uh, we want our young people to feel welcome in our spaces, welcome to be themselves, welcome to try new things, welcome to ask questions. And finally, the S is support. We want to support these young people and these students to be independent and to be strong. And eventually what we're trying to do is work ourselves out of a job, right? We want our young people to be so strong and so healthy that they don't need us anymore. But just because they don't need us, it doesn't mean we leave their life. It means we then get to become their greatest cheerleader. And we get to watch them just the same way that Miss Holmes still watches me and still likes my Instagram photos over 18 years later and says, Michael, I'm still proud of you. We can all do that. And I look forward to seeing what each of us are going to do as we continue to innovate in our classrooms and in our communities to make sure that our young people's hearts, minds, bodies, and spirits are honored and respected in every single learning environment that we are able to help create. Educators, relatives, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate the chance to spend time with you. And we're going to present uh, our keynote speaker, Michael Redhead Champagne, today. Uh, I'd just like to, to say a few things, uh, Michael, when I listen to you, you know, I, you know, you're, you're a true, you're a true freedom fighter, you know, and I, I, I really applaud you for, for the work you do. You know, I, I, when you talk about the, the bell tower, I, I, I was uh, raised in, on floor place for three years of my life before I, my, my father took me to Norway House to be raised by my grandparents. So I, I don't, I don't uh, remember the bell tower at that time, but that was my early beginnings. So, so with that, I, again, we're very honored to have you here. So I'm gonna ask the elders to, to present you with uh, the star blanket as, as a token of your appreciation. Thank you.